government has confirmed that MEC for Health, Dr. Nomatemba Mukheti, is currently in self-isolation at home after she tested positive for COVID-19. MEC Mukheti presented with mild symptoms before she went to test on Tuesday. The Health MEC was one of the first people to receive the Johnson & Johnson vaccine back in February under the Sisonke program in Gauteng. The COVID-19 vaccine prevents severe illness, hospitalization and death. According to the Health Department's statement, MEC Mukherjee is not exhibiting any severe symptoms and will remain in isolation for the next 10 days. Now let's discuss this. We're joined via Zoom by a public health specialist at the University of Cape Town, Dr. Karen Begg. A very good morning to you. Thank you so much for making the time. Good morning and uh, welcome to, to all your listeners and, and uh, viewers. I don't know if you're listening to that, uh, the MEC story just now. Why is vaccination important, including the COVID-19 vaccination? Let's start there. So when um, we have a, a significant pandemic uh, like we have now, the, the issue is that, that we end up with a significant number of deaths, which you've just reported in terms of the, the number of recorded deaths. But of course, we also know that we have a number of excess deaths, which are uh, likely in, in large part due to COVID as well. Um, but more than the deaths is that we also have a significant amount of what we call morbidity. So those people affected by the disease in the short term as well as by the disease in the long term. And uh, that is all preventable with vaccination. So uh, once you are immune um, with vaccination, then your chances of getting the disease uh, at all are significantly limited. And if you do get the disease, then you are likely to have a much milder course uh, and so we will reduce deaths, we will reduce the long-term effects of the disease, and we will reduce uh, hospitalizations and the severe effects of the acute disease. How long then does it take to have immunity after vaccination? So each vaccination um, is slightly different, but we know that in the, um, in the vaccinations, in the vaccines that we've been seeing for COVID, that the vast majority will have um, some form of good immunity within two to four weeks. Um, and so obviously the MEC has had uh, a breakthrough uh, infection. She has been vaccinated um, and she still has the disease. And I think the important thing here is that we know that for instance, in the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, uh, which has a, a, a good protection, that in the trials, it has had 100% protection against death. In other words, of all of those um, 43,000 odd patients in the original trial, uh, none of them died versus the, those who had not received the vaccination. Um, that 82% were protected against severe disease. But that does mean that a small proportion did get severe disease when they got the disease. And um, a slightly larger but still small proportion got uh, moderate to mild disease. And so in this case, the MEP has still got disease, but as we are understanding that uh, she has mild COVID. And that's really what we're wanting, isn't it? That, that if you do get COVID, even after you have been vaccinated, that you only get mild disease and that hopefully you are also protected from the long-term long effects of, of COVID, uh, which we will only know in time, but that is one of the hopes uh, of vaccination. How can we allay fears about uh, uh, people still getting infected after being vaccinated? So I think the important, uh, the important thing here is that we will have some breakthrough, uh, particularly as we have small numbers of people vaccinated. Uh, but in, in most cases, first of all, there will be much fewer of them getting disease. And those that do get disease are likely to have mild disease. And, and not severe disease, so they're unlikely to be hospitalized uh, or need hospitalization or any form of, um, of intensive care. Uh, and then, of course, the more vaccinated that we get, we start to reach into the space of herd immunity or population immunity, as we prefer to call it nowadays. And what that means is that the more people that are vaccinated, the less chance there is for the virus to move between people and get uh, and, and, and infect. So we really are uh, wanting to get as many people vaccinated as possible 
so that we can reach that, that magic population immunity. And when, what happens there is that the virus, uh, so as you are, are around people, and if those people around you are vaccinated, there's much less chance of that wild virus moving between people. And uh, eventually what then happens is that even those who are not vaccinated, which will hopefully at that point be a very small minority, but some people are unable to be vaccinated for uh, because of, of their own immunocompromise, and they will then also be protected by those of us who are vaccinated around them. So we really want people to continue being vaccinated. But in the small, while we are reaching towards uh, population immunity, uh, having sufficient people vaccinated for population immunity, we all need to be taking all precautions. So we know that, that mask wearing, uh, together with physical distancing, together with hand sanitizing, together with making sure that we don't congregate in crowds, that we don't uh, gather in, in confined places with poor ventilation, all of those still remain important. Uh, so we just, with vaccination, we have a very important additional tool in our toolbox uh, to fight this pandemic. You raised something very important about people whose immunity is already immunocompromised. What do we know about uh, this uh, sector of the community and uh, their uh, responses to the vaccine? So remember that, that when we're talking about immune compromise or other contraindications to, to receiving the vaccination, uh, we know that, uh, that currently that there's no contraindication to HIV, to TB, to people with those kinds of diseases. So those people, unless they are incredibly ill, uh, should still be receiving the vaccine. Um, so there are very few contraindications to receiving the, the COVID vaccination. And so we really would encourage everybody to, to access. And if you are concerned uh, to, that, that when you go to the vaccination center, or you can use the toll-free lines to ask uh, whether, you, whether you are contraindicated. But um, other forms of very mild immunocompromise, such as diabetes, uh, those are people that really need to be vaccinated because they are at, at very high risk of severe disease uh, of COVID. So they are, it's, it's much better for them to receive the vaccination and therefore to be at lower risk of uh, both COVID and the severe forms of COVID. So there, there really are incredibly few contraindications to receiving the COVID vaccination. Dr. Berg, South Africa plans to delay the second dose of Pfizer vaccine by up to three months, with the minister saying they want to reach as many people as possible and then build up the immunity, because the evidence coming from the UK has shown that there's better immunity developing if someone gets a second dose after three months than if you do that after three weeks. Is this the right route to take? Absolutely. It's an evidence-based approach. You know, the one, um, so, so whilst we, we, we may uh, complain about being a bit behind the rest of the world in terms of vaccinating our population, uh, one advantage is that we can learn from, uh, from the rest of the world and the experience that they've had. And so what we have seen is that the immunity, um, both in the laboratory and in the real life setting, the immunity is stronger with the when we have two dose vaccinations such as Pfizer, that um, having a little bit more of a of a gap between the initial dose and the booster dose does promote better immune response. So that's a, a really good um, evidence based approach to have. Of course, what that means from a logistics point of view is that it allows us to get more of the first doses done uh, before we start calling back. The risks always of, of having big gaps between first and second doses, as we know with the extended program for immunization, so EPI, which is what we do for, for our babies and infants, um, is that sometimes we, we have a higher loss to follow up. In other words, uh, the longer gap you have between doses, the more chance there is that people move or that people forget, and so they don't return for their second dose. So there's always this balancing act that we have to make between um, what the, the, the laboratory studies and trials show us with gaps uh, versus the logistics uh, of, of the risk of loss to follow up. Uh, but certainly, uh, I think with the high um, uh, notification and, and the high awareness of people is that we would really want 
uh, people to be returning after their three months. Uh, and so that would be really important. And I think that we've had some really encouraging data coming through in the last few days of uh, people receiving their SMSs and arriving at their vaccination centers within, uh, within hours. Um, you know, so, so we need to be making it easy for people to receive their vaccination. It needs to be in, um, you know, very close to their homes so that they can access either via walking or via public transport. Um, that it needs to, there needs to be as few barriers as possible. And if we do that, then uh, there shouldn't be any, uh, you know, there shouldn't be any problem with people returning for their second booster dose. Dr. Karin Bech, as you can imagine, there's lots of questions that Abu Kok and Abu Mkulu have uh, that they would like to know about this that we can't cover uh, in this uh, conversation. But let's thank you for talking to us today. An absolute pleasure. And please get vaccinated when you can, as soon as you can. Absolutely. I'm in line. Dr. Karin Bech there for you. And uh, we're inviting you in.